Okay, I think we are live this morning. So uh, welcome, everybody. And um, I'd like to uh, welcome you to our, our 10th town hall. And um, today we are, we are joined by uh, Eric Johnson, who's uh, Director of Innovation at Bright Machines, which is a company that, that uh, works in manufacturing automation. So um, why don't we, uh, Juan, do you want to say hello to everybody? You're muted. There you go. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to see everyone today. Uh, I just wanted to uh, give a quick reminder that uh, we're still expecting some response from that survey. Uh, a lot of you have responded so far. I think we have one of the three people, but I know we have three more people. Yeah, you're kind of, your audio is tailing off a little bit. Just, okay. just speak louder, uh, Adil. Okay. Can you, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, that's good? good. That's good. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, we've uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback uh, on the survey. I think we've gotten uh, over 350 now, but we still need oh, a lot great. of your yeah. We still need a lot of your feedback as it helps us uh, when we talk to uh, employers like we like we uh, indicated in the conversation to you guys. So uh, hope hope we get more response. Oh, that's great. No, that sounds like a lot. A lot of people have responded and we are we are trying to position our our students uh, more in front of other companies and looking forward to how we can, you know, best uh, help help with, uh, you know, finding positions for people, too. So uh, those those surveys will really help us a lot in understanding um, how to how to best get you in front of other other companies that we're we're starting to talk to now. So um, great. And um, and we're heading into. Yeah, like the ninth week of our program now. So um, we still have like classwork going on. Um, I got I got a vaccine this week. I've been I have missed a few days. I'm a little bit out of things right at the moment. Um, missed a few days. I I I, I kind of got a little sick from the vaccine. Not terrible, but uh, I wasn't working uh, able to do that much work. So, um, but we still have. Um, I guess we still haven't talked about the um, the project phase yet, John. Yet have we with 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 people? No, we haven't, and uh, we are hoping to put some like uh, final details of that this week, so that like, we can communicate like what, in like final detail what they're to expect. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I've been thinking about different projects and and uh, how to. So I, I would look for. Um, I think we'll probably be. Um, sending out some something to people to see like kind of where they are, whether they're ready to, to transition. You know, people are, some people are still catching up to finish the full curriculum. And um, so we're going to try to figure out when the best time to start, you know, everybody on projects and, uh, and have appropriate levels of projects for people. So, um, so expect some email from us about, or communication from us about uh, uh, what your interests are and, and what kind of projects we'll, we'll be working on. So okay, so uh, why don't we why don't we start today? Uh, talk and introduce Eric. Eric, uh, welcome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, John. Happy yeah. to be here. So you know we've had a number of people on these town halls. Um, you know I think one of the interesting things is the diversity of you know where a software career can take you. Um, you know biotechnology. You know there's traditional you know web web development and and design and things like that. But um, yeah, your space is really an interesting one. Yeah, we're, we're in the factory. So it's a place where most of the software uh, feels like you're in a time machine. It's from 20, 30 years ago. So <laughs> our, our team wants to change that a bit and use all the modern software for factories, which, um, which could definitely benefit from it. So that, oh. that's, that's our challenge. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. So how, how, what does the, what is your vision of a modern factory look like? What is, what kind of, uh, maybe you can give us an overview of kind of what you guys do and, and how, how your systems work. Yeah, sure. I can uh, show some video of some of our things running. Okay. But, cool. uh, you, you want me to jump in that, to that? Just the Sure. Yeah. We, we can start with that. Or, yeah. I mean, our, to answer your question, like uh, yeah. running, you know, assembly work, a lot of uh, manufacturing means assembly, just putting two parts together, right? A car, yeah. an airplane, you know, anything, uh, anything sitting around is just a bunch of parts put together. And that's a combination of people and machines. Um, but um, it requires a lot of different skills. And, you know, mechanical engineers, database people, front end people, process, maybe five to six different, very different skills to get anything done. 
And so the, the better those folks can collaborate and work together over uh, different geographies, different locations, different time zones, uh, the better. So uh, that's, that's re it's really about bringing the right team to the factory floor, right? There's, you know, where the folks like, you know, that are new software engineers are not in the obvious places for where things are being made, right? A lot, a lot of people are saying, hey, I want to move to the middle of Nevada to work in a factory. That's really what I want to do. Or, you know, there's some spots, you know, like yeah. around the country where everybody can be in the same spot. Yeah. But um, more often than not, you need to pull a, a broad team together. Okay. So, yeah. So yeah, let, let's take a look at like what is what does a factory really mean? Even that people have different ideas. Uh, what, what? Where does our software uh, get get used? Okay. I should say, I'm a I'm a mechanical engineer, so I do a little coding. But you all know, you're so uh, you know can talk about things, but yeah. you're stuck with a. An, I am not an actual software engineer. You're stuck with me today. <laughs> I will I'll do my best here. Um, so this is. Um, this is one of our facilities in Austin, and it's wow. a line of robotic arms. They're all hanging from the roof, to, so they have most flexibility. And you see some software here, which doesn't look very modern. Uh, you know, it, we'll, we'll look more at that later. Okay. But, you know, what is this uh, line doing? Um, we're putting some boards in boxes, which sounds simple, but... You can see, you know, already, if you've never seen a factory run, you know, these robots are moving pretty carefully, right? This is stuff you or I would do pretty much without even looking at things. We would just be able to do this with our hands, talking to each other, not, you know. Yeah. These robots are kind of being very meticulous, right? And they're kind of getting twisted up and untwisting themselves here and picking up screws. And, you know, this whole fancy thing here in the front, all of this, right? everything you saw so far, is just to put in this one screw. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so okay. This is something you know you do around the house without even thinking. You're playing with the kids, talking to other people. You know, no. In the factory, this requires all of this uh, equi specialized equipment. So we just put in one screw. Wow. And then here, you know, this next this next little move here, we're just putting in this board, right? But it has this. See that little fancy like angle in? Yeah. So again, something that to any person is pretty obvious. That probably took somebody, uh, a good experienced engineer, the better part of a week to get that process perfect because it's gonna be happening you know, repeatedly, right? Thousands of times now. So that took an engineer sitting there, literally you know, with their head in this robotic cell, um, interacting with some very old software to, to make that happen. Um, you know, now it all looks fine and Oh, so you're modern. trying not to damage the board, get it hung up on the edges of the box and things like that. You got it. Yeah. And so it, it's really easy to describe, right? If you were to describe it to me, hey, the board goes in kind of this way. Hey, no yeah. problem. <laughs> but to have that same conversation to, uh, you know, any kind of automated system these days, we'll, we'll look at that in a second. It's a, yeah. it's, a, <laughs> it's a different kind of conversation. Okay. So here we are putting in, you know, some more screws. Um, here's a washer. Again, sim simple operations, but very specialized equipment. So this is the story of manufacturing. It's specialized equipment, uh, takes a long time to tune things. Once it's running, it looks fine, but when it breaks, uh, it can be you know, quite slow to fix. Mm -hmm. So Bright Machines is trying to kind of upgrade the software that's used for this and make it easier for uh, a broad range of folks with different backgrounds in the factory environment or software to come together and do automation much faster and automate more things. So, okay, cool. yeah, so, you know, there it is. So you can imagine this is the kind of context that a lot of this work ultimately happens in. Now, the last year, a lot of people are working from home and a lot of what you just saw there could have been done from anybody sitting at their kitchen table uh, with a laptop, if given the right software. Oh, right, right, right. Right. So today I have to be in Austin, drive out to the factory, badge in, you know, um, go through all these procedures before I can get to work. Um, so access is a, is a big issue. And here's just, um, whoops, this is <laughs> one of our facilities over. Now this robot's moving a little bit faster. Yeah. Um, and it's just loading some test cells here. So, you know, this is also, you know, typical uh, application as well. 
when you say a test cell. Yeah, so here we're, we're just picking up these devices and this okay. is really what we just call pick and place. Pick something up okay. that was yeah. just made off, off this conveyor here and put it in this machine, which is oh. like functional testing. Oh, I put, see. Yeah, yeah. So you take it off the line to get it into a test unit and then uh, get it either pass or fail. You got it. Yeah. So they'll just you know push some buttons, run through some diagnostics and make sure it's ready to go. Um, so, you know... In summary, like everyone's seen pictures of, you know, robot arms and factories. Like, I think this is a picture of a, one of the Tesla factories, you know, or any, any assembly line, you know, in Detroit, just rooms full of robots, you know, always looks very impressive. And <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Like, yeah, you know, that's what heavy automation looks like. Uh, um, a big a ballet, like a ballet, you know, kind of all moving at once. Yeah, exactly. And they're just missing each other. And, um, you know, there's people sneaking around, making adjustments. <laughs> um, this this robot is in San Francisco. This we use for some R and D work, and mm -hmm. you know it's just one arm in a cell. We're doing some experiments here for vision. Uh, a big part of automation these days is seeing things and sensing things. So that's fun enough. It's just our one test cell. Yeah. But the part of robotics that is not so great at all is this. Uh, it looks this like is, ladder logic. Yeah, it's it's basically um, ladder logic, and <laughs> you know, well, almost nobody in our group knows has probably even heard of that term. Maybe you can explain. I don't know. Well, this is probably the this is the anti example, but uh, maybe you explain what the state of the art, how people used to program these things, or maybe they maybe they still do. I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, this is very similar to ladder. So this this is how people still program things, uh, which at, at the at the lowest level, people still edit files like this. Now, wow. I don't think anybody wants to become a software engineer so they can uh, write, you know, lines like this. Right. Uh, this is just saying move to some register at a certain speed and a certain smoothness. But this is basically a G code. Right. If you ever look at what, um, like, here's a, like a 3D, my 3D printer here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, just a little bit collecting dust these days, but it got a lot of use earlier in the year. If you ever look at the readout from a 3D printer, it looks very similar. It's just go here, go there, this fast, this slow. Well, all of this fanciness over here in this Tesla factory looks exactly like this. This is robot code, a tribe of Fennec. And, um, you know, I don't think anybody wants to spend their time seeing if we forgot a semicolon or, or linear move, you know, uh -huh. this is not uh -huh. where it's at, but that's, that's what it looks like today. So bright machines wants to change that. This is, uh, this is our, this is the way we program robots. This is the way we interface with that cell that you saw. We, we choose a bunch of tools and this is a, uh, this is all in browser, right? So this is, wow. um, a virtual robot and we're using the exact same controller software uh, as the actual robot. Cause you don't want to be surprised and say, well, I thought the software was doing one thing. Then I go to the factory, right? And smash everything with the arm. So uh, what does it mean for the user? It means instead of that list of text that we're looking at, um, it's a much more visual interaction with the arm. So here you will see, we'll just do it in a simple pick and place. Um, so, you know, a lot of these moves have a place you start. Um, and it's not just any old place. It's like particular places like where screws are. So boom, mm -hmm. we pick a point, go get a screw there. And what are we going to do? We're going to go place a screw over here to hold that heat sink on. And look, automatically we get a path. I oh, didn't yeah. have to go through step by step. Software's like, yeah, you probably want a path that looks like this. Okay. And now the user can come in and interact with the path. So our vision is to kind of to give people kind of superpowers instead of crawling around the machine, you know, uh, very carefully making adjustments and moving slowly in a simulated environment like this, you can move very fast and make mistakes, right? So here, all this red is our tool here. I can show oh. that again. And that's basically hitting this rail. Oh, why well, didn't raise it up high enough? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And so I could have found that out slowly and been really quick on the e-stop in the factory, but I don't like my life to be so exciting all the time. <laughs> so, yeah. it's, you know, that's part of the fun of automation is you have to be fast on the e-stop, but not every day, right? And so yeah. here in the simulated environment, we can iterate just, the, you know, a, a key idea of any kind of engineering and software, just iteration, have the confidence to break it, try again. Um, 
so you know here we are um made some changes boom oh okay now, you see the path is clear now we have some things here to you know change the path that are you know pretty intuitive we, we change the angle on this we change the departure vector and we can look from underneath and we can make it transparent so we're able to see the environment um you know it kind of feels like a video game almost yeah so this robot has i don't know is it like three three degrees of freedom or four or something but the uh it looks like he had to move his wrist up to that in that case to yeah, so you'll see that. it now. So this this robot has six degrees of freedom. Oh, it's six. Okay. So yeah. now, you'll, which is kind of all the degrees of freedom you could have, right? So this this robot can move exactly like your arm can. Um, so there's other kinds of robots that only have four, um, but that one you get it all. And underneath all of this, we still have some code, but you know it's .js. Oh yeah, it looks, it looks very familiar. Right. So. It's a little more comfortable to most people. Even mechanical engineers like me have, you know, can interact with this. And so we've done the work to go from the, there's still plenty of low level code to do, which is interesting, yeah. but for the users, you know, this is, this is kind of the level people prefer to work at. So there we are. Okay. So this is like JavaScript code. And then uh, is, so, what we were showing, like what you were showing in your example, is is that generating some code, or or is this is this a code that runs separately, or or how, what, what's the relationship between those two interfaces? Yeah, so they're linked, and so uh, they basically update each other. So you can either write the code and then play it in the sim, oh. or you can interact with the sim, and and this is the hard part. It auto updates most of the code. I see. So it's it's kind of we call it you know it's bi directional. So depending okay. on what you're doing or, you know, um, if, if you're not a lot of folks, um, you know, in the, that are doing controls work in the factory now would prefer to use a visual environment as opposed to JavaScript. So it gives folks a chance to start doing one way and then do a little bit of another, you know, we, 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 we cover it both. I see. Okay. So like, so building that inner, that, uh, interactive, it's, it's going to generate some temp, like boilerplate JavaScript code with the, with the way, what you've, what you're seeing on the simulator, but then you can go tweak it if you need to find adjustments or, or some other different kind of concern that's, uh, yeah. To modify this code. Precisely. So you see like, here's some position information. X, Y, Z, and some angles. Yeah. So if you really wanted to get out here in the decimals, and um, uh, there you go. You can yeah, actually, oh, I see, right. Yeah, you can confirm that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Now, how, did, how does this JavaScript get into a robot? So that that's a pretty uh, big stack, and it involves, um, you know, a bit of C Sharp, um, sometimes a bit of Python. Um, so like a lot of modern software, um, there's many, many layers, right? From the infrastructure all the way to what actually gets deployed. Um, but in what we're running now, um, that there's go from JavaScript to C Sharp to a particular robot controller. And okay. the nice thing is you can stay over here in, in JavaScript or visual and use different kinds of robots. Like one of the challenges in automation is, you know, if, if you start working in Detroit, it's all FANUC arms. These, these, the ones we see here, you know, major okay. manufacturer, you know, in Detroit, you could probably walk into any coffee shop, any bar and say, Hey, I have a question on how to program a FANUC page 500 in the manual. <laughs> and like someone will be like, Oh yeah, like I, I got that. Been doing this forever. But then you go somewhere else, you know, I don't know, say Silicon Valley, you're running a Denso robot. Well, the concepts are the same, but the, the language is different. And so it's kind of a barrier, right? You can, learn automation but every time you have a different project hey i gotta learn a whole new controller language it slows things down so we can have kind of a general language on top um, that allows folks to work with different arms okay yeah so so are these programs like are they outputting um like ultimately are they outputting like some g code to the robot like are you kind of compiling it to eventually like g code which you, i know you, i have a 3d printer too and i know you know you which got is, it. Which is like a one way. And this, I mean, it's this, basically saying run this motor for this amount of this amount of time at this speed. And then just a sequence of those kind of things. You got it. This is basically 
there is a like a compiler layer below this, but this yeah. is like the G code layer right here. Just where okay. you're going, how fast, how smooth. Yeah, yeah, okay. And you know, there's no logic here really. If you bumped into something, keep going. If you, uh, <laughs> you yeah, know, if, uh, if you skip a step, we will never know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very um, um, you know deliberate. There's there's no there's no real logic or smarts. Okay. Uh, there. Well, well, how common is it to have robots that have sensors that are trying to detect things like uh, their their distance away from the part or or the you know measuring you know measuring the forces to make sure that they're not impinging on something? Is that is that common or are things kind of like just dumb bunch of robot bunch of motors that are dumbly like trying to move whatever you told them to move? Both. So here's some examples where we can see some cameras, right? So up here, kind of on these funny looking things, these are two cameras. I don't see what you're pointing at. Oh, I got to get my, my pointer here. Okay. I st I'm still looking at the JavaScript code. Oh, no. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's not updating here. What do you see now? The JavaScript code still. Oh. Ah. There we are. Oh, there we go. There we Sorry go. Nice. That, I see some robots. <laughs> so, okay. So here's an application where we're using vision. So here's a camera and another oh, camera. Okay. Uh, and here's a camera with this huge lighting system around it. Um, mm. So if I if I play this, this is three different uh, solutions for the same problem. So this is um, putting in d uh, dims. Oh yeah, memory. Yeah. And those are tricky to put in by hand. I know I've done a lot of that. <laughs> you got it. So yeah. if anyone's like, you know, built your own box computer, you know, back in the day, or, um, there's, you know, you got to put these slots in. So data centers are just full of these things. Yeah. So we've built three, four different machines, uh, different, slightly different ways. Um, but all of them use some vision. And this one here uses some force. So, okay. you know, it looks like there's a lot going on, but. Um, this is just mechanical engineering, just, you know, plates of metal. Uh -huh. and here is a, a force sensor. And these cameras, we look right at the edge here to do the final alignment. Oh, okay. Wow. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty. Um... Is that on the left? Is that the view that the robot has? Or, or is that uh, something yeah. else? <laughs> yeah, this is the view of the camera leaving, yeah. <laughs> so. oh, okay. <laughs> yep. But the, the, I can show you maybe a better image coming up. Um, I, I can find you exactly what the robot sees. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Yep. But you can imagine, you know, there's 24, 16 or 24 of these, um, you know, and it's within a, like a few hundred microns. So, um, you know, fractions of an inch here uh, that every single motion has to be aligned wow. to. Wow. So this is where the, the new software really makes the difference, right? Is vision processing. You know, you probably, you know, you see people using vision for autonomous vehicles and, you know, people walking in the stores and all, all kinds of things these days. Um, but using vision just to take the error out of the robot arm, still plenty of work to do there. Now you'd think people have been doing this for decades, but it's only recently that the software and the algorithms on the vision side are sort of good enough to be used everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's, there's still plenty of work to do. If I had to summarize kind of what Bright is doing, just really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the left here, if you walk into a factory, this, this is exactly what you see. You see these screens, you know, it's like, it's not just the 8-bit graphics, right? But it's like, what is this stuff? This is an act, This is actually one of our old control screens. Like, look at this, move abs. Like, what does that mean? Does that mean I should do a sit-up? I'm supposed to move my abs. Absolute, I bet. I'm Absolute. Betting. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but I mean, it's just not obvious, right? Yeah. I mean, even if you work in the factory every day, yeah. this is what, what, what come anyone out there that's interested in UX or UI, you know, I mean, you guys are probably screaming now, right? Like, what this is just a chaos. And on top of this, this is a this is a very uh, common program here. Um, this is called Ignition. You know, again, some engineer like me, you know, drew this picture and I thought these colors were amazing. And I thought this was clear. Uh, you know, this is someone's factory. Like, you know, follow the line. I couldn't even tell you what's going on here. Right. This is really what factories look like today. Um, and for the person that designed this or uses it every day, it's good enough. 
but mm. this is what Bright Machines uh, thinks you know user interfaces should look like. Um, they're clear. They're mo you know it just feels modern. Here's mm -hmm. a, a kind of nice flow of the recipe. We're doing this. Uh, then we're doing you know we're doing this, then this, then this, and then there's some error recovery and there's some branching, um, clear display of graphics. So this is kind of the journey we're on. We're going, this is the world of automation we're trying to leave. This is kind of a bit of the modern world we're, we're trying to add. Mm -hmm. And that takes a huge amount of software at yeah. all levels from yeah. you know in infrastructure all the way down. We talked a lot about robots so far, but you know, any organization, whatever, whatever is happening on the product depends on infrastructure, right? People setting up GitLab, AWS, um, um, all the things that check uh, where all your shared code came from to keep the legal department happy. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you, may, you know, it's not obvious, right? If you're, if, unless, unless you've worked in like, you know, Mike has in, in a software or a large software for a long time, how much happens in the background, yeah. right? That is just as important to allow everyone else to get their job done quickly. Um, so we have to build that whole thing from scratch. Wow. Um, yeah. So this is what we're building towards. So here's very similar to that first line you saw. There's a bunch of conveyors and parts move in from one side to the other, different operations. Um, and this is all again happening in browser and um, everything here is using real controllers. But, you know, it, I, the graphics aren't great yet. We haven't uh, done, done the work on the rendering yet, but you know, this is a whole factory right here in your browser. Yeah, you can tell what's happening. You can see all the parts and yeah, I yeah. mean, we have a, there's no parts shown here, but you know, that's yeah. where a, a dim would be going in and parts yeah. back. Um, but, you know, it gives you the, the ability to fly around, zoom into any process, see what's taking a lot of time, see what's taking uh, less, less or more time than, than you planned on and really tune it up. So this is what we're building towards. How did we do it? Did we start uh, from scratch, scratch? Mm -hmm. No, we started with Unity. Oh, okay. So I'm sure folks out there interested in gaming know about Unity. They, you know, uh, popular company. They went public last year. Um, so this is, you know, Unity is a gaming platform and it's used for all kinds of things. So we've built a factory simulator on top oh. of a gaming platform. And so, oh, okay. but that's the cool thing about code, right? It's all the same. One of our first hires was a person that was an expert in gaming. Uh, and this is the kind of code that person's uh, used to write. And this is off the Unity website. You know, this is an uh -huh. code. You know, yeah. Though. So I don't know what yeah. game is you're stabbing or fire in effect. <laughs> yeah. <whatever>. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Hopefully your robots are not doing that. <laughs> right. This is uh, exactly. <laughs> this is off limits for the robots. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, code's code, right? And the exact same kind of things that you'd be doing as a gaming engineer, you can now do for, for robots. Um, so it, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, yeah, this is, um, I'm sure everyone will recognize this as a data center. I spent a couple of years working in a data center and, you know, this is, this is where most of the modern world uh, happens, but I wanted to show this because, you know, to me, this shows what software is about. It's about automation, right? It's about making things happen when you're not there. No one's in a data center, right? But an incredible amount yeah. of things are happening, all being run automatically by code, by script. Like nobody's ever here. I used to be here because I'd have to, you know, pl un unplug these wires and upgrade machines and things. But that's just, you know, just the physical layer. Logically, you know, software is all about things happening without you, right? from a simple for loop to a data center. Yeah, and people kind of feel that same magic in auto in factories. You know, it's not obvious, like, why is a factory interesting? Um, it's really the same thing. It's like, once you get things running and the team has done its work, things are happening without you. You're still busy adjust adjusting things. I mean, any even the most automated factories now are still full of people, but so much more is happening with a combined effort. And I just want to show this, I think one last okay. uh, little clip here. 
This is a simple, simple project um, that was oh, done. Here's, here's in, the robot's view, the camera. Yeah, this was done in the evening. And this is the robot's view here of a camera. Uh, we're just taking pictures of these circuit boards yeah. and getting out some coordinates. So this is just console logging coordinates. It okay. sounds really simple, right? So this took a few hours to do in JavaScript. Um, this would have taken weeks to do with existing uh, with the existing, existing tools people use in, in a factory to just get a simple set of images and get out X, Y points. Um, mm. So there's nothing pretty about this, right? There's no UX, there's no nothing. We're, we're looking at a, a browser running a local server, console logging numbers, but this solved the problem. This is exactly what oh, yeah, we yeah, had yeah. to do for the customer. So I just wanted to show that modern software tools, you now just a little bit of JavaScript, a little bit of Python are just so powerful in general. Um, you, you know, even when it's not finished, it's just basically hacked together. Yeah. It's incredibly useful. So just, you know, we saw some yeah. be beautiful UX in the product. Here's like no UX. You need everything. And so all this of is it just somebody, somebody needed to say, hey, I need to know where all these parts are. We have these, these, these uh, uh, aligned images or I, I have but these images in here. Let, let's write a little Let's write a little code so I can click onto a, a position of a part and and get that number to take it off onto the screen. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Simple so, as that. But yeah, being able to do that, like you know, is uh, not everyone in the world knows how to do that. You know, I think the people in our course, so they're learning that. You know, you know, I, I'm sure our our students could write this code, um, and uh, and and yeah, do you, like you're saying, it's like a superpower. You get to <laughs> do something that take take a few hours instead of weeks to figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's like a good exercise and you think, geez, well, this sort of simple exercise. But if you just show that to your friends in the factory, they'll say, thank you so much. You just saved <laughs> us a week. Like, here, here's the next one. Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, uh, yeah, it's, it's open territory there. Uh, you know, I'm thinking like that this could be like one of our, uh, you know, sample projects for we give to people like if they wanted to try something like this, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you can send me a little definition of what 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 that was about and we could we could like give it as an assignment to people to to try to do that it sounds great mike i'll show you in a second we are hiring all over the place <laughs> any help is very welcome right? <laughs> we get plenty of problems to hand out okay anyway i wanted to show you just a little bit um what we call perception um so we you know we've seen these robots running around I'm just going to keep dodging uh, the sunrise here. Sorry. Um, uh -huh. When I was at Google, I, I worked in a lab. And this was my robot friend. <clears throat> He's about eight feet tall in a Whoa. cage. Um, you know, not, not always very friendly. <laughs> but this guy was picking up hard drives and putting them in the shredder and sorting them and spinning around. Uh -huh. um, so pretty sci-fi. So I'm over here in this lab uh, trying to train this robot. And literally just the next lab away, you know, it's where the folks were working on self-driving cars. Oh yeah. And you know, they're doing all this fancy stuff, right? LIDARs and sensor fusion and taking images from 12 cameras and you know, all the modern stuff we hear about. And I just really felt like this makes no sense. You know, next door, there's all this crazy technology, like the yeah. very cutting edge of vision and perception. And here we are over here, the next lab. Um, kind of stuck in the past. Yeah, and yeah. The robot's cool, but our software, like you saw before, is a whole different world. Mm -hmm. And so, there's a lot that brings this world to this world. And we're taking some of the things we're doing at Bright. Um, you know, this is just just a random collection of stuff. We're inspecting pins here. This one's kind of neat. We're using depth cams. Anyone who's ever played with a Connect. Um, it's probably seen okay. similar images, but this is basically a camera that gives a 3D representation. And you see it's a little bit noisy. Yeah. It's not like a sharp and focus image, but it's pretty useful, right? How just knowing position and how far away things are. Um, you, know, you can imagine is really useful for picking things up, putting them down. Um, and on the right here, we're recognizing these are just a bunch of cameras sitting on my colleague's desk, but the software is recognizing them. It's saying that's a camera, that's a bracket, that's a camera, that's a camera. So it's going right from CAD, just some 3D virtual representation, looks at a real image and says, yeah, 
I got a match. Yeah. And so this is pretty heavy algorithm stuff, right? This is all C code and people working under PhDs. Um, this, this is pretty simple. This is folks like me, you know, Mecky is using really nice software from companies like Intel. <laughs> so e on either one of these, you know, you can jump right in and contribute, right? If you're interested in like the heavy theory and the math, great. If you're interested in like applications and just making it happen in the cell, great too. Um, you know, there's tons of range of, cool. well, but the, the reason that we have to do these things, and if you forgive me for this, um, uh -huh. Horrible picture of uh, <laughs> this is just not not pretty to look at. Uh -huh. <laughs> what, is, what is going on here? What is this? So this is this is um, someone's finger, my finger. Yes. Yeah. And I'm just putting in a screw, right? Oh, okay. And, and you don't really think about like what are your fingertips doing all the time, right? You're, you know, you're in the kitchen, you're in the workshop, <laughs> like whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but your your fingers do like the, all these amazing mechanical things. Like it's constraining, it's aligning the screw to the the plate here. It's I'm I'm detecting where the edge of the plate is, so I know where the hole is. Yeah. Right. And um, it's it's has just the right amount of squish. I mean, fingertips are incredible, right? You can yeah. one second you can touch a dog's nose, uh, and the next you can hang your whole weight off of like you know a ledge. Um, same, your fingers are in, in pretty incredible. And yeah. so in and factories everywhere, um, you know, fingertips are doing the work. Um, you know, people truly are amazing. Um, they figure things out. They detect defects. They do alignment. You know, if you are hanging out in factories, people are just talking to each other a lot. And they're not staring at stuff. No, they're just doing their thing, talking, getting the job done. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so this is really, we don't have fingers, right? Robots do not have fingertips. <laughs> And so all the fancy stuff we were looking at before, the cameras, the depth cams, the fancy algorithms, this is all we're trying to do is replicate this missing part. Mm. Um, but there's plenty, plenty of work uh, to do there. And plenty, all that plenty of work uh, happens all over the place. <clears throat> so Bright's got eight global locations, um, two places in Mexico, actually, Austin, Bay Area, Seattle, uh, Yakum, Israel, two places in China. Got a bunch of folks in Europe, um, and most importantly, your kitchen table or garage. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this is uh, I just I didn't I should have asked. This is my colleague Barry. Um, uh -huh. This is from you know March thirty first. He's moving to Atlanta. He's very happy. His wife's got a great job there, so he's he's leaving for Atlanta. This is his garage. So we are going to ship him a robotic cell for his garage. Oh wow. Um, and problem is the garage is two inches too short. So if anyone has good ideas for <laughs> making his garage two inches taller or our welded steel frames, anyone likes to, to do some like chopping and welding, uh, on the weekends, uh, like I need tips. We need to make the cell two inches shorter. Or he could yeah. jackhammer the floor or something. So great. Yeah. Take out the slab. Yeah. We didn't think of, we did not think about that. We were just thinking about going up. Yeah. So, you know, We'll do whatever it takes. If we have the right folks, if they want to work out of their garage, like no problem. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's just kind of um, some random bits I wanted to show you guys to kick things off, but we can maybe oh, that's get great. into some questions. So like just, uh, so we, you guys are producing the software and then who are your who are your primary customers that are using your software? Are they, are they mechanical engineers and other people working, working at individual factories? Do you like consult with companies to help them implement their systems? What kind of, what kind of jobs do you do? Yeah, so our main customers now are OEMs. So um, these are you know, companies that you would see when you're out shopping, you know, people that uh, put stuff in Home Depot or you know, Target, uh, you know, people that make appliances, power tools, um, you know, anything sitting around your desk. Um, so these are, you know, they're OEMs, regional equipment manufacturers. They've already hired what we call contract manufacturers, people that have the factories. Okay. System integrators, people that make the machines. You can imagine yeah. a lot of parts that come together in those machines. And this is kind of the old model. It's quite slow. And it's a lot of risk. So we oftentimes will go directly to um, the folks with the product 
and they mm -hmm. want to say, hey, we want to rethink the way we're doing things. So they'll work with us to do a few lines. Um, and then it'll be their staff we train that runs the lines, that expands them. Okay. And, and they, they like this because, again, they, the, a factory team right now, you can't really get anything done in a factory without these five people, right? If, if the controls person needs to go pick up their kid or the mechie, you know, needs to go to the doctor or whatever, work kind of slows down. It kind of stops. So on the one hand, it's fun. You're with this team and you guys do everything together. Right. And just, yeah. You know, right. factory maker. On the other hand, you know, it, all it takes is one or two people to be gone and nothing happens. I see. So we yeah, were kind yeah. of changing that for them is they can be much more flexible of, okay, we got these three folks. Great. They, they know what they need to know. To, I to, see. To, it's to easier understand. to kind of cross train people with uh, not having to know so much specialized knowledge about really yeah. nitty gritty, the parts <laughs> of the process. And the specialized knowledge is out there, just easier to share, right? Because we see. have this like, so imagine, you know, imagine right now you're trying to coach me on, I've got my head in the machine trying to make a change. You know, we're on Zoom. I'm showing you like these gray buttons. Like I hit the button that says jog abs. Uh, nothing happened. You know, it, yeah. it's just really an awkward conversation, right? Well, hit it again. Oh, I heard a click, you know? Okay, <laughs> like, yeah. Come on. So yeah. much better to be in that virtual environment where we can both see the same thing. Like, hey, mm -hmm. I adjusted the recipe this way. Okay, great. I check that in. I change the logic that way. Okay, let's try that together. Okay. So it puts everybody in the same context, which just makes it a lot more fun, speeds of communication. It, this is how software works, right? Yeah. When you check in your code, somebody else reviews it, it gets pushed. Everybody's using GitLab and collaboration. Like you can't do software without collaboration tools. Right, right. But in a factory, it, they haven't discovered this yet, really. I it's, see. It's very much a Zoom call talking about a gray button. It should be much more like, hey, man, I checked in the code. Let me know what you think. Be back in an hour. Right? Yeah. I got your yeah. changes. Sounds good. Yeah. You're going to run it on the simulator. and Yeah. It's, it. a, yeah. it's just way more fun <laughs> to work that way. So. Yeah. Well, I guess it's kind of like a philosophical question. It's like, you know, why, why do we have, why is our society like to have these issues where, you know, it does seem like we, we, you make some big advances in the way things are done. And, and, you know, obviously in our, in our time, you know, like technological change is, is getting faster and faster. And it's, it's hard for even humans to kind of keep up with that change, I guess. And, uh, but um, yeah, you do see these things and it's been for decades, you know, you have, you, there's, you, you kind of have people who feel, look like they're stuck in a, they're stuck at, you know, like they went to school or, you know, they, they, they comb their hair the way they, they did when they were in high school. You know, I kind of think of that, you know, like, I don't think my, my hairstyle has changed other than getting further back, uh, you know, and you kind of learn one way to do things and then you don't change ever. And uh, I think that happens in industries. And I, I don't know why, if you have like a theory about like, why is that happen? Why does it take so much to kind of get people unstuck? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I think what we see in the factory environment is, is two things. One is there's, it's about risk and it's, it's not yeah. a lot of people, you know, are, are hesitant to change because it's a risk. You invest time to learn something new or propose an idea, you know, whether or not we talk about it, it's risky. And there's a risk to you personally, but here in a factory environment, there's also a risk to, you know, tens of millions of dollars of things that, you know, aren't happening. Mm -hmm. And, what Bright has done is we've tried to really bring together these two worlds, the world of software and the world of process automation in the factory. These worlds are, you know, it, it took a lot of um, work at Bright to get these worlds talking and productive together. And, and we've done it internally, but for other people to do that, um, it requires risk takers, right? It requires someone that's new with, has new software skills that says, ah, you know what? I thought factories were boring. And um, I thought it'd be the last place I'd ever want to be. I'd want to, you know, I should go, you know, do my own web startup or work at SpaceX or like whatever. So, you know, there's so many cool things to do in the world now in tech. Um, but they say, no, you know, I, I, want the, I want to take that risk. I want to come in here and use my skills to, to change. And then I take someone on the other side, says, yeah, I'm going to run my factory differently. I'm bored with this. Um, but it, it takes both sides, right? And as soon as you have two folks that are willing to take a little risk, I think, amazing things can start to happen. Um, 
And that's really, um, that's the journey Bright Machines itself has been on. And I think that's the journey uh, a lot of industry is on, you know, even in software only companies, you, know, you get stuck in the rut. Um, you know, we, we, we want to, you know, we want to start using a lot more Python and JavaScript and a lot less C sharp. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, Mike, yeah. I'm sure your whole career has been using these major like transitions. Right. And so, yeah, yeah it doesn't take much um, uh, of you risking personally to really make a difference organizationally and industry-wide. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, obviously yeah. folks that, you know, you all work with um, are taking huge risks and that's, mm. that's what it's all about. Yeah. The, the transitioning to careers and things like that. So um, yeah, but uh, yeah. And I think the uh, in an environment where you can, I can see how scary it is. Like, you know, if you're, if you're saying, no, oh, let's throw out everything we're doing today, we're, you know, we're running along producing a million dollars a week in parts and then, uh, and then let's stop everything and then replace everything with, with something different. We don't know will work or not. You know, you can't really No no manager is going to make that decision. So uh, yeah. How do you get to the point where you can say, Hey, we can just incrementally improve things continuously instead of having to change everything um, all or nothing. And the way a lot of folks do that is the same. If you have a big software project, you know, it's, it's rare that people will just say, scrap it, start again. Yeah. Right? You'll start saying, okay, we're going to change this bit, see how it goes, change this bit. And then very incrementally piece by piece, it takes three times as much work, but when you change things piece by piece, then eventually you say, aha, now we've rebuilt something carefully. It's the very same thing in the factory environment. So, okay, we're going to change this cell, this line, this process, see how it goes. We can mm -hmm. always go back, um, but that's that's the ro robust way to do things, and it yeah. takes time, and not everybody has the patience uh, for that. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, at Bright, you're working on multiple projects. So if this one slows down, it's okay. I got other projects to work on, and mm -hmm. so it, it it keeps people interested. But if you're just working on like one project at that careful pace of change, yeah, it could be three years. Like this is this is boring. Yeah, okay. so but we have plenty of work so it's just work on lots of projects at once yeah because yeah things take, things take time to do carefully well we had a question from uh elva and sh and uh, they're asking um about the life cycle of the deliverable of um let me see if i can translate the question um so i think you know what there's a there's an undercurrent to this question about and i'm sure you get this all the time is the the uh, kind of from a policy point of view and the societal point of view of displacing people who are manual workers and manufacturing workers with automation and and what is the uh, what is the morality of that or what is the you know what is the or economic consequences to people's lives about doing stuff like that um, but they're also asking about like you know what is what is the life cycle of your, the, the way you, the way you, I guess, think deliver the, your software and, and, and what, how does, how does that work? Um, no, it's, it's a great question. I mean, thank you for bringing it up. Right. I mean, you can't talk about automation without addressing this at, at some point. Yeah. And you could say, Hey, I should have just brought it up. <laughs> I, I, I talk about it a lot. So um, I think if from outside the industry, it looks um, it always looks a bit different. And um, so I think there's two questions that often in the public discussion get a little bit overlapped or certainly by the media often confused. Um, mm -hmm. One is like, does automation take jobs? And right. the other is where do the jobs go? And so um, I wanna take the second one, like where do a lot of people say, you know, where do the jobs go is when a company decides to shut down a factory or an industry and move it uh, without, you know, proper uh, notice to people or yeah. a proper plan or they're the only um, factory in town. Um, and, and that's kind of what makes the headlines. And this is really a policy question. You know, I think it's, it's, it's ridiculous, particularly in the US, how easy it is for a company to not pay tax, shut down an operation and move it far away. Yeah. Um, and just leave everybody you know, hanging, like there's no training, there's no uh, reasonable um, unemployment system. So the social safety net here and the way we think about the way large companies and people interact, um, you know, 
in my opinion, uh, is not correct. Like other places, certainly in places in Europe, there's a much better model, right? That if a company wants to take this decision, that's fine, but they have to do it responsibly. Right. Um, there's kind of a commitment to like your workers and society. It's a two-way commitment. You know, like you can't just. Exactly. I mean, I guess we have employee, employment at will kind of laws in the United States, but you're, you know, people are investing their livelihood, their lives and their training in one company. And but the company should be, I would agree with you, like have responses, the reciprocal responsibility to that community of workers. Yeah. And, and so this is often, you know, this is gets headlines and for good reason, right? Because it, this is what really hurts people. Um, the question of does automation directly take jobs? There's not a lot of evidence for that. And I'll, I'll just give one example. Um, one of the favorite questions to talk about when you, you know, talk to somebody from a large manufacturer, or big tech company, you know, like I um, like take Apple, for example. Yeah. They say, oh, yeah, we did this big automation effort. I say, okay. Um, this, the trick question is how many robots per engineer? Uh-huh. And, and the right answer is something like, 0.5. So when you decide to automate, you actually have to staff up with technicians and engineers. So it's actually almost a two to one ratio of new people, new jobs per automation cell. Um, and this is, you know, with existing software, this is with Bright, this is just what it takes. Now, those folks are doing a bit different things, but they're on the line and they're responsible for the output. Um, so the, the data actually shows there's more jobs when you automate because you're just, you're making more things, right? So you're just getting more throughput out of your factory. You're building things that weren't possible. Um, my last job, you know, we built things that are very small. Everything was smaller than a millimeter. So, wow. oh wow, <laughs> you know, I, my technicians and I, we had great fun, you know, surgery style doing some things by hand. We had good days and bad days, but that stuff is not possible without automation, right? And as soon as we automated, we tripled the size of the team. Um, and so it allows you to do new things. Yeah. And so I, I don't want to get into it in like a lot of detail, but I would say to me, that's really the theme <clears throat> to separate what automation is really doing and what policy and companies are doing. And let's hold companies accountable. Uh, yeah. and let's hold governments accountable. You know, when you bring a company to town and promise me all these nice things, great. I decide to keep my family here. When the company leaves, why am I here? Yeah. Um, different conversations, right? But absolutely an, an essential topic these days. But, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Well, we we had an, Chris asked the question about. He says he's he's working on robotics in in uh, using Python and um, does would that would that kind of skill set uh, translate to working for your company? Absolutely. You know, everyone. Python is the glueware of the modern world. Um, so our, a typical stack on our vision side is C doing the algorithms, uh, Python doing all the connection, um, and mm-hmm. then the kind of our UX and deployment. Okay. But there's no avoiding uh, Python. And also on, <laughs> on, on the data side, you know, if you're working with matrices and uh, time series and, and numbers, you know, Python is you know kind of the go-to for data science. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think you know. Python's a great choice. Yeah. Um, and we actually, geez, I should, I should just say, um, we, you know, this is. Oh, your roles. This, yeah. Yeah. This People is were asking our, about this. This is oh. our jobs board. Yeah. And oh, cool, this cool. is very incomplete, but this is sort of global software openings. Oh, um, Austin, can, Texas, full stack developer, cloud engineering. Okay, cool. San Francisco has some vision, machine vision. You got it stuff um and java engineers for back-end stuff oh you know one thing i was gonna that occurred to me just i, I didn't ask in the in the demo but uh you, you're saying you're running all this simulations in the browser is that all javascript or are you using like uh uh web assembly or what do you know like how, how is all that done it looks pretty <coughs> complicated yeah so the simulation stuff is web assembly and okay. so we, we start with unity and do our customizations oh, on our own, yeah, 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 our yeah, own okay. front end layers. And so we kind of have Unity and React and our own stuff. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So the Unity stuff gets wrapped as Wasm. And, oh, and great. Shipped. Okay. Yeah. So Unity Unity kind of can target the browser through WebAssembly. And uh, and so you still have all the high performance um, yep. we'll, we'll, code that can run in the in We the, render in the at 30 to 60 frames per second. 
Oh, amazing. Um, it's just like playing a game, despite okay. the bad Zoom, you know, <laughs> the way Zoom shows video, it's pretty smooth. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I ahead, actually have like uh, two questions. Go ahead. So uh, number one is, what what is the potential for like uh, job growth in this industry? I think that's one. And secondly is for uh, I'd say like a participants who are like just getting into software development, what would be like the starting point for them, you know, to get into? Because like part of the things that I see there is like you're talking about two stack developers, but because they're new, we're basically just trying to get them grounded in like a particular language or track. So how do you see that translating for them as you know, like new software? One of the the nice things about the the factory environment is there there's such a large range of uh, opportunities. So in a lot of software things, you know, you have to get to a certain level and really prove yourself, and you know, really feel like you're ready to jump in with everybody else. Um, and it's it's quite a you know a level to get to right before you can feel like okay, I'm ready to to, to slot in here. Because of the the factory environment is so dynamic. It's, it's it's really a great place to start, right? And wherever you are in your journey, whatever skills you feel confident in, or ones you're still building, um, if you just roll into any factory, um, and again, they're they're everywhere, right? And you say, "Yep, I'm interested in helping you out with data." They'll say, "Great, uh, here's you know here's a USB stick with a Microsoft Excel file from ten years ago." <laughs> That's the same. so you go back to your kitchen table, spin up some Python. And it's magic. It's like you have just performed magic for this factory. Like, hey, here's your charts. Here's some correlations. Does this help everybody? Yes. You know, can we can like, so the automation factory environment is is really, um, it's just such a big range, right? So even with um, just basic Python skills, you can contribute really to any factory out there. And the same with uh, front end. You know, I, I give that little example of clicking on the pictures, right? Someone's doing that in a file system now. They're 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 in you know Windows and they're opening up a picture and they're renaming it and they're typing here. It's this is um, how it's done. You can say, hey, you know what? I had some time last night. Uh, just spun this up. Um, so th that's the nice thing is even with sort of the skills that you get uh, as a student or early in your journey, those are immediately applicable to so many factories. Um, now, it's a challenge, right? Because you're, you're not going to see a job advertisement for, hey, we need a, a Python wizard to come help us out because they're happy in the past, right? So, so that's really the, the unfortunate part. Like, like, you know, you can change their life tomorrow, but they don't know it. <laughs> and so... Um, you know, it takes a bit more, you know, pounding on the door saying, you know, you guys, you guys need help, trust me. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean you, you had to be at Google for 10 years to, you know, to, to do that. So, and, and it's always a good um, team environment, which is one of the reasons I really like the industry. Because again, even if, you know, you've got that part of the software dialed, there's a context, there's a process engineer that's going to tell you, well, here's what it means. You know, there's a design engineer that's going to want to change. So you get, you know, there's four technicians that are going to say, actually, this, this, is, this is really what's going on. So you get to work with a lot of different people, a lot of different skills. And like every single one of those skills is required to keep the factory running and keep things uh, happening. So it, it's, it's a very um, different environment than a lot of um, the tech world. Right, that's just yeah. like, you know a little bit more competitive and like oh look at my stuff. It's like no, like there's no space for that. <laughs> it's just like the machines are running, great, we did it, cool. See yeah, I mean, see you tomorrow, everybody. <laughs> it is cool that everyone's focused on like one a very visible, tangible process and and physical like uh, instantiation of like of success. <laughs> everybody can see what what it is that they're trying to pull pull in the same direction toward. Um, exactly, it's yeah. it's authentic. It's yeah. like, like everything's running great we did it we'll do it again tomorrow yeah it's very authentic yeah, yeah. yeah. i know when i was at google I, I was one of the shocking things to me is i worked at i worked at one of the bigger uh groups uh, in here in kirkland and and you know a thousand engineers or whatever uh working out of these uh, several buildings 
And uh, when I got there, I, I would ask people like, um, um, do you know who all the, what, what do all the people who do here at this site? And like hardly anybody knew <laughs> beyond like the 20 people that they worked with what other people did. And it was, it was kind of like, wow, we're like, we're all here for this. You know, we knew what like the management of the company, cause they would hold weekly meetings to tell everyone what the, the big picture of Google was, but um you know, nobody knew who was who was doing what at, at our own site. People you'd see in the lunchroom every day, you had no idea what they were working on. So, uh, um, so I, I like this environment that everybody has. You know, like you can see the factory floor, or you know, you know what what what's going on there. It sounds like a nice a nice community of of people. Yeah, I mean, it. I've I've worked in a ver- various you know manufacturing environments, but. It was really, you know, I'll, I'll never forget my first week, like actually in a clean room, in a factory with hundreds of people. Uh, give give factories a chance. They're they're not these like horrible, you know, 18th century places. Um, they're they're quite fun. They they run on software. They need better software. They need um, all kinds of different skills. Um, and you know, bright machines. We're just doing our small part to kind of connect modern software with those places. Um, cool. And we need help. <laughs> All right. Well, great. Well, we'll, we'll share with everybody um, your, maybe your LinkedIn profile. And, you know, I don't know if you, people might want to message you or whatever, but uh, of course, uh, yeah, we'd love to, you know, and I'll, we'll, uh, if you send me a, a link, link to your job board and uh, I'll just kind of share that out with everybody. So we can, I, I, I really appreciate like you opening our eyes to like this whole other aspect a whole other world of, of where software development uh it could be uh, a really useful skill so that's uh that's really fascinating so all right I Mike, think it was a pleasure thank, thank uh, you guys yeah great presentation and that's so interesting so thank you and we're we're kind of running out of time here i want to respect everybody's time so um but appreciate it and uh and uh looking forward to uh seeing you in the future or, or seeing what your company is doing in the future that'd be great okay See you on linkedin Okay. Thank you so much, Eric. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye, everyone.